If you don't know Romina Mariano, she's a Wits and Charlotte Checker alumna, and she earned her medical degree here at Wits and then completed her internship, community service, and medical officer time here at CMJ before moving on to the University of Oxford, where she has completed her DPhil, which is equivalent to a PhD in clinical neurosciences. Uh, she focused on novel quantitative and functional neuroimaging techniques, and her research has been published in high-impact peer-reviewed journals, and she's got a lot of experience in clinical medicine, translational clinical research, and clinical trials. She is currently um, working as a strategic projects associate for the Rhodes Trust and as a postdoctoral fellow at Oxford um, in the contingent of the Global Health Security Consortium, working on pandemic response strategies, preparedness, and global health equity. And she's a member of Columbia University's VaxSafe Working Group. So very qualified, and we're excited to have Romina here today to um, do our first ethics lecture for the year. Romina, I'm gonna hand over to you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's really great to be here and to be reconnecting and connecting with so many new and known faces. So I have no disclosures for this talk, but I do have some caveats. And so those are, there will be more questions than answers. I will by no means I'm seeking to endorse or compare healthcare systems along the way. The content is really just based on my own reflections of an experience that I've had over the last few years. I'm not an ethics expert, and this is intended to be conversational and hopefully somewhat engaging. So please feel free to ask questions along the way. I assume Jared will monitor the chat and or hands up. So please engage. So for background context, in 2016, I went to go work at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. I chose this picture on the left of the screen because it was the only one on Google that had a gray sky in the background, which I'm sure Lyle will know is the most accurate representation of the UK. Um, and then I started working here in a unit that was doing clinical work, clinical research and clinical trials. And I was fortunate enough to work with an incredible team from all around the world. And they included members from Europe, Spain, Portugal, Germany, as well as Thailand, Malaysia, Brazil, Nigeria, Jamaica, the US, and even a few people actually from the UK. So after having this experience, I decided that today what I'd like to do is just to reflect on two scenarios that I've been presented with over the last few years and some of the reflections that I've had. I think what I learned was that our world is complex and multicultural and ethical dilemmas are common and challenging in every field and in every aspect and biomedical research sometimes is at the forefront of these challenges. In 1982, Medawar wrote a paper reflecting even on what Plato thought about the sciences and I think it comes down to a reflection that was made there where that the tension is continuously that science is supposedly based in empiricism and founded on objectivity and yet on both sides of the table, it's just a human endeavor. And so we can't dissociate it from the social and ethical context. And so the two scenarios that I'd like to reflect on today, the first one being the integration of research into the clinical setting. So beginning here with that doctor patient interaction and then along the purple lines, taking clinical data, taking it up to the group level, analyzing it and hopefully bringing it back in some valuable way to the patient in terms of outcomes, prognosis, uh, treatments. And the second scenario being in that same interaction, taking that data, but then submitting it to a biobank or repository, potentially for some kind of artificial intelligence algorithm analysis, and how in that blue line, you're going to a much larger group of people, but hopefully still in some way bringing it back to the individual in the form of drug discovery, or better understanding of disease and risk factors in large populations. And in the blue line also just with that understanding that oftentimes this type of big data has a little deviation and ends up informing policy, which then will in some ways also impact the individual. So this is just to say that a lot of the work that we do might have immediate clinical impact, but might also be speaking to a larger process that then includes the policy work that happens. And so in that first scenario, of the integration of research into the clinical setting, the ethical focus will be on consent and on the, in the second scenario, on data ownership and data governance. 
So I'd just like to set the scene a little bit to explain exactly the type of unit that I was working in and how it came to be. Over the last 20 years, the UK government has established, together with its life sciences industry, a strategy for its life sciences. And they started with the understanding that they wanted patients to be at the middle, but then they wanted academia, industry, and the NHS to work in a collaborated fashion in order to bolster their life sciences value chain, which you can see here at the top with the arrows, which includes everything from discovery and R&D all the way to commercialization. And so while this is primarily focused, of course, in the pharma industry or medical technologies, each one of these blocks within the life sciences value chain was benchmarked and strategies were created in order to improve it. And then below that, they then started looking at what are the critical enablers of having a life sciences strategy and how do you support this type of work? So of course, clinical research is the setting in which I ended up in and the prime, one of the critical enablers of this and the primary topics for this discussion today is going to be the use of data. So from that prioritization of clinical research, they then wrote a policy paper on clinical research delivery. And the first quote is one of their top five priorities for clinical research. And that is actually that they want clinical research to be embedded within the NHS to create this research environment where all health and care staff can support and participate in clinical research as part of their jobs. And so that's an ambitious goal. The unit that I worked in was one of those types of units, an NHS unit that included clinical research embedded within it. That is still somewhat of a pilot study almost. I would say it definitely does not reflect the general healthcare in the UK, but I think as they start to prioritize this type of clinical research embedded within clinical care, there are a lot of things that we need to think about because at times this adds value, at times it adds complexity to the doctor-patient relationship, and at times it also has the potential to negatively impact clinical care. And I think anytime you're negotiating adding a research component to any clinical endeavor, you need to really think through a number of different factors. And then the other thing they did was a lot of strategic communications, which resulted then in a survey in 2018 where a survey that they did showed that a large proportion of the population are actually very comfortable sharing their data with the NHS and comfortable with the NHS analyzing their personal data. So scenario one, as I mentioned, with all of this focus on clinical research, I ended up in a unit where this was the case and in a role which was split between the clinic and clinical research. So just to set the, the context for this, Every clinic visit and research visit occurred simultaneously at the same time. Every patient was asked at the first time they visited the clinic or given the opportunity to sign consent uh, for the use of all of their clinical data, prospectively and retrospectively, including investigations, imaging, tissue biopsies, anything that they'd had done along the way for clinical purposes. There were standard questionnaires that were used to aid the clinical history taking and ensure consistency of data collection, particularly with regard to risk factors, or mood and um, questionnaires, cognitive screenings, et cetera. Anytime routine bloods were taken, they were asked to have additional blood samples taken at that time. Then there was also a focus on recruiting these patients into specific projects, and there was overlaps with the clinical trials unit. So it really was an integrated service that offered clinical care as well as all of these other components. So of course, we think about what are the value adds of this? Patients were engaged with their care and with research. There was an element of shared knowledge creation. It limited the amount of travel because the unit that I was working in covered a rare disease in the whole south, southern UK. So patients from all hospitals in the south of the UK were referred to this unit. It enabled them to have both clinical and be involved in research in the same visit and it enabled the study of a rare disease because it increased the amount of clinical data that was available um, in these, all these patients that were coming to this one centralized clinic point. So now that we understand the value, and of course, you know, there's no argument that clinical research is valuable, but I think there's so many challenges and potential pitfalls and acknowledging them and ensuring that you're accounting for them is really the important part. So if we take it back many, many years, we know that in ancient civilizations, the concept of civic virtue was first popularized. And I think I went into this research role somewhat still naively sitting in this idea that 
everybody was just, everything was noble. They were noble endeavors. We were collecting data for the greater good. And in the period of enlightenment in the 18th century, this was really something that was, was well established. But of course, science is not inherently ethical. And from 1947 onwards, we've had a number of ethical guidelines established. And I think the biggest challenge is that these guidelines are reactionary. So something really has to go wrong before guidelines are established to tell people how to do things the right way. And so then we've had policies and regulations, ethics committees, oversight committees that monitor the scientific conduct. And this is just because we've realized that scientists are not as virtuous as once believed. So what are some of the modern challenges that I think I experienced or saw play out in this type of environment? You have growing entrepreneurial incentives within science and clinical medicine. There are financial incentives, but also people wanting to publish in the right journals, have personal advancement, fame, and get involved in politics. As I outlined in the, in the scenario picture, some of this data really does have significant impact into policy. Pharmaceutical companies have an influence on research and prescribing. There's manipulation of results for publication or to remain in the good graces of those that are funding you to align research priorities with funding priorities is something that's very difficult. And in a recent study that was done, um, well, a recent paper that just came out as an editorial in Nature, 8% of researchers in the study, in the survey done in the Netherlands, admitted to having falsified, it was an anonymous survey, admitted to having falsified or fabricated data, but more than 50% of them also admitted to having engaged in what they called questionable research practices, which is really anything short of completely making up data. And so the pressures of this environment within a clinical setting, I think is something really unique because you are navigating two worlds and there's a lot of gray area between them. Then of course, people hide or fail to publish negative results. And fundamentally, what I also realized and I negotiated with myself is that this idea of patient centricity and having the patient, patient really at the center of all of this somewhat becomes more about enhancing the probability that they'll agree to take part in your research than actually thinking about how the research is benefiting the patient. And that's quite a tough line to walk. And so if we think about all of these challenges and say to ourselves, all of this could be detrimental to clinical care when we're bringing research into the clinical setting, and there's already a power dynamic in the doctor-patient relationship, as well as participant or patient expectations, how do we really take informed consent in this setting? So Professor Michael Parker at the Bioethics Institute offers some thought on consent. So he outlined that we're all comfortable with the fact that healthcare workers have a duty of care to their patients. But what becomes really challenging is once you start including researchers, bioinformaticians, statisticians, et cetera, into the realm of clinical medicine, how do we create a new scope for what a duty of care is to the patients in an environment where you're merging two spheres? And so he first outlined what type that we have to decide, what type of consent are we actually asking from someone? Are we asking them to specifically consent to a particular uh, research activity? Are we asking them to consent to governance, so for others to decide what happens to the data we collect? Are we asking for broad consent, such that they'll consent to a number of different issues? And so first and foremost, understanding what are we asking them to consent to? But then regardless of the model that we decide that we are asking for consent to, we also need to know that consent is always based on imperfect knowledge. And he argues that placing too much emphasis on consent means that we have failed to pay enough attention to other ethical concerns. And so the real question that we need to ask ourselves is given that consent is always based on imperfect knowledge, what are we doing to account for that to ensure that we are protecting the participants with whose data we're, we're asking them to donate? So I came across at the time a paper that came out in JAMA by, run by some researchers at the NIH in the US. And the research paper is entitled, What Makes Clinical Research Ethical? And they come, they come out or argue for seven ethical requirements for clinical research, which are listed below. So we have social and scientific value, scientific validity, fair subject selection, a favorable risk benefit ratio, independent review, informed consent, which in this list 
is only one of the seven aspects. So arguably, if you account for all seven, you might then start to be working toward what um, Professor Parker was talking about, about ensuring that beyond just informed consent, you are looking at a more broad and holistic view of the experience that you're asking this participant to be engaged in. And then number seven, respect for potential and enrolled participants. So if we start with the first three, some of these are, are ideas that I think we often use in a very high level way. You know, social and scientific value, what does that actually mean? And I would argue that almost social and scientific value, you can argue that your research needs to have one of the two, you can try and measure that objectively, you can make arguments for why what you're doing is really important. But what I really struggled with a lot of the time was that often social and scientific value might actually be at odds. So how do you have esoteric research happening with a lot of resource going into a rare disease and then balance that out with a social impact? If you are seeing fewer patients in a day because you're also doing research activities, is that a negative social impact, but scientific value? And so trying to find a balance as to how you say we have as a human being, as the doctor or clinician, you are a limited resource, you have a limited time in your day, the system within, your, within which you're working is limited within its resources, of course, some systems far more limited than others, but overall there will be limitations. And how do we balance social and scientific value and ensure that we are really finding the sweet spot between those two? I'm not quite, I definitely don't have the answer. As I said, the talk is about more questions than answers, but this is something that I think is critically important to think about the minute that we begin to bring these two worlds together. Scientific validity, quite straightforward, but I did find that thinking about the methods of your, of your research, even the statistical analysis that is the bane of your existence for a number of years, or whenever you're doing any scientific paper, considering that as part of the ethical requirements for your research, I think is quite an enlightening sentiment, because you start to realize that everything you're doing is not only to get a paper published or to um, pass your exams, but that ultimately you're trying to create a study that is as, as robust as you could possibly make it to ensure that any time somebody is giving of themselves toward the work that you're doing, you're taking that and doing the best that you can with it. And then we come to face subject selection. And this is something that I think is the biggest challenge that we have because within the patient populations and even within the researcher populations, there's a significant lack of diversity. So we have a lot of studies and clinical trials done in very specific populations with data that we're not quite sure is immediately generalizable to other populations. And we also have limited diversity within people that are conducting the research or ultimately responsible for negotiating these relationships in clinical trials or with pharma companies. And so I think those two actually go hand in hand. And there's been a lot of lobbying that's being done, papers written in journals where people are asking for both diversity in the populations that we're studying as well as diversity in whose voices we're elevating within the research, research community. Favorable risk benefit ratio is also something that's really interesting. And so I thought I would share a story of the really something that was the most fascinating time I'd heard people discuss and the ethical implications of risk benefit. So Dr. Julia Shaw, who works in London, came to present a talk on her work where she works in false memory and the science of memory. And her work is predominantly done with the police department in the UK, where she studies interrogations of criminals and the idea that you might be able to actually implant a false memory by the way you interrogate a criminal or suspect such that they will actually, um, there'll be a false confession. So it's some very interesting work that she's doing. But the study that she set up in collaboration with Oxford was one that was looking at whether or not you can actually implant false memories into people. And so the big ethical question was, do you implant a positive memory or a negative memory. And ultimately, after a lot of discussion, the ethics committee decided that it would be favorable to implant a negative memory, because at the end of the study, when you reveal to the person that actually that memory that they had of committing a crime or doing something terrible was false, they would be left feeling relieved and happy. Whereas if you implanted a memory in that person of some them either achieving something amazing or having done something great in their lives and at the end of the study revealed to them that actually 
they were just the normal person that they were at the beginning of the study, they would be left with a feeling of loss. And this really struck me because it just kind of emphasized in a really extreme way, the impact that research has not only in that current immediate setting, but also for that patient going forward. And in my case, it was more considering things such as incidental findings and what that might mean for participants. But this I felt was just a far more interesting example of how you negotiate the risk benefit ratio. Now, intermittent review is something that we all would have experienced and peer review is, is a critical part of any clinical research or research endeavor, but I would argue that this actually should be split into two. So we have the classic scientific review by individuals unaffiliated to the research. And of course, these would be experts who would be commenting on, on the methodology and, and um, integrity of your research. But the other important aspect to this, and what I experienced while I was doing the research is if you include patients and members of the public, in that same review process, you actually get some really interesting feedback from them. So as part of the research that I did, we included patients in the early stages and asked them to review the study methodology, the um, um, patient information form, sorry. So the patient information forms, the study methodology, the activities that patients would be undergoing during their study visit. And I think by involving patients in the, the early process, that also serves to assist in adjusting that power dynamic because it really does feel like shared knowledge creation. And you do get some really interesting feedback about things that you assume would be very easy for someone to be able to sit through or endure, and it's all for the greater good. But when you ask the person, you know, what is, what is the limitations of what you think one person should go through in a day if they are involved in research? That really helps you to shape a study that is trying to improve their lives, but also ensure that that risk benefit ratio is still coming into this. And then members of the public, there's a big drive for, for public engagement. And I think that's also a really important part because engaging with the public means that you are then adding value in that societal way slightly more than you would if, if we all hold on to, to the research that we're doing. And I think COVID has highlighted what happens when you have messy research that's happening actively in real time on a global stage. And actually, if we engage potentially more with the public on a more day-to-day -day basis, it might improve the concept that, that people, um, that research is actually hard and that it is human and that we're all just trying to make the best of things and really infer the most accurate results that we possibly can, as opposed to it being something that's empirical and objective and just leads you to facts. And then, of course, the informed consent, um, as I said, we've already touched on this, and that just forms as one of the seven. And then finally, respect for your potential enrolled participants. So the final point that I'll make on this scenario is whether is to ask the question, is data sharing becoming the eighth requirement? Should it be that data sharing is part of the ethical framework with which we do our research? And how do we ensure that the research outputs that we, that we make actually do add value to the patients that we are deriving the data from and to a wider community. And how do we make this accessible? Particularly when you're in a place like the John Radcliffe Hospital, they, you, you wonder to yourself, if you are publishing in a journal, which is very expensive to um, subscribe to, you know, how are you actually making an impact in the places where it matters most? And they have, there's a drive for open access publications, which is wonderful. And I'm very much felt that open access is a great way to go, but there's also the ask for data availability statements, the idea that we should be sharing raw, raw data from, our pub, uh, from the publications and from the work that we're doing so that other researchers can use that and reproduce your results and add even more um, assurances that the results that we are making clinical decisions are actually accurate. There are moral and ethical arguments for data sharing. And I would argue that, in fact, actually, the shift in thinking has already begun from why should we share data to how should we share data. And so that brings me to scenario number two. So segueing into the how should we share data brings me to the other reflection that I've had, which is if you are back at that same doctor patient um, interaction and you're collecting that data, but for the purposes of depositing it, depositing it either in a repository 
or in a biobank, how do we share the data and how do we protect institutions, people, patients, and ourselves when we're doing this? And this is something that I think we're all involved in in some way or other, whether it's your smartphone or your Apple Watch, or if you had a PCR test done for COVID, which has now been sequenced and ended up in GISAID, we're all data points somewhere at this, and we really are going to have to negotiate how do we navigate a world where we are constantly data points and where we're asking other people to be data points? Who owns the data and how do we govern what happens with it? So clinical data is increasingly valuable to both the public and private sectors, of course, but we have a number of challenges. And so alongside the development of biobanks, big data, repositories, and artificial intelligence algorithms, there've been a number of organizations as shown on the right that are starting to think about how do we actually live in a world where this is becoming something that we're dealing with day to day? So the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford is looking at the ethics of big data and artificial intelligence. The Ada Lovelace Institute is negotiating how do policymakers actually use these things and what are the, um, the potential pitfalls in this type of research that we need to be aware of? Because I think that often this, these types of words of biobanking and, and AI are sold as the ultimate solutions to all of our problems, the best way to collect data on millions of people where we know the results are gonna be accurate. But this is not always the case and they can still be open to interpretation. And even when you're dealing with massive data sets and artificial intelligence, you still need to go back to those same seven principles and understand really what are you asking, how are you storing the data, and what is its intended use. The problem is that if you don't think about those, even if you are dealing with machine learning and artificial intelligence, overrepresented populations can benefit from this type of work, whereas underrepresented populations will either be completely dismissed or even harmed. And that was made prominent by, if you look on the right-hand side, that picture that says AJL, that's the Algorithmic Justice League, who's done a lot of work looking at how algorithms are based essentially, they're only as good as the data set that they trained on. And so they were looking at the racial implications of the fact that if you train algorithms on only one type of person, then other groups of people are either completely ignored or mislabeled, or you might end up treating people incorrectly based on the algorithm. And so this poses further challenges to achieving equity as it can easily perpetuate disparities. And then and a number of the times in some of the work that I did looking at machine learning, you know, there's, there might even be a lack of clarity as to how the conclusions are reached. So we really need to, as these are valuable things, they are incredibly useful, but we really need to interrogate how we're using them. And I think these will be the biggest ethical questions that we deal with going forward, particularly with the increased use of digital technologies and smart devices that are constantly collecting people's data. So the scenario for this, um, for this reflection has really come out of the, some of the more recent work that I've been doing with the group currently, which is looking at data repositories for COVID-19. And so this is, um, these are two maps that came out of a GISAID. And the one on the left is showing you how many sequences per thousand cases people submitted to GISAID during COVID. And on the right, how many days it took them to deposit that data. And so there's some interesting reflections. Some places are equally sequencing a lot and submitting that very quickly. Places like China, sequencing a lot, but submitting very slowly. Or places like Chile or Botswana, sequencing somewhat minimally, but submitting very quickly. And so there's very different patterns in how people share data, how, they, um, how comfortable they are with sharing it and the speed with which they share it. And this becomes particularly emphasized during COVID because you're now not only dealing with individual countries or the individual patients within those countries, but we're looking at a global scale and this concept of global governance. So during the so reflections on this time is that international data sharing is fraught with issues and limited and delayed sharing can be very problematic. There's no incentives to share data and penalties for countries that did share are extreme as everyone in South Africa would have experienced. If you don't have equitably distributed data collection, then you have non-representative sampling strategies and you end up with biased data. Now, this might be a case of places just not being able to do the sequencing, which is another concern, but it also might be hesitations with data sharing. And so creating an environment where people feel comfortable that they're able to consent 
even as a country or an institution to contributing their data to a repository is really important. In the case of a number of the repositories that were used during COVID, they were very complex data government arrangements. And so if you have massive amounts of data, but they're not readily accessible, where is the value in that? Data privacy issues mean that most metadata is held nationally and not internationally. So in the case of the COVID example, if you have massive amounts of raw sequencing data, but you don't have any of the metadata, you can't really make any clear, you can, you can phylogenetically classify it, but you can't really speak to the evolution of the pandemic on the ground. And so now you're talking about the fact that, yes, you've got an amazing repository with all the raw sequencing data, but actually we need some of that personal data. It's very easy to say we'll make it not identifiable and that will protect everyone. But when you realize that sometimes that privacy actually is to the detriment of the scientific output, how do we negotiate that? And so global surveillance technologies and protocols are going to need to recognize the principle of data sovereignty. So, as I said, more questions. How do we ensure in any case, whether it's on a global scale like COVID and a small database that we're working on within a hospital, how do we ensure that for the country, for the patient, that we're respecting their data rights, but still have standardization of pipeline and access to the necessary data in order to make that research add value? How do we protect researchers and ensure that credit is given to the right people? And how do we ensure that the patients providing the data actually benefit from it? So these are questions that are currently being asked by a number of different organizations. And there's a big collaboration um, occurring to try and think about answering these questions. And I say think about it because these are really incredibly difficult questions that are gonna take a lot of people, a lot of time to really understand. And then, Let's hope that it's, you know, we've already seen Cambridge Analytica and a number of other data scandals. And so in the same reactionary way that all of our other ethical guidelines have been developed, I think we'll have to accelerate our development of some governance strategies around all of this data. But what can we do for the moment? So I would argue that fundamentally, it still all comes down to that individual data point and that individual doctor-patient interaction. And that at the end of it all, regardless of the resources available to you, it all comes down to asking yourself, why and what are you asking of the person in front of you? And whatever the context, are you accounting for their imperfect consent? Thank you very much.